know, calm the Russians' fear in order to have peace. Otherwise, they'll just keep fighting. Okay, and then we'll strengthen, uh, and, and also this, you want a settlement that will strengthen international institutions as the preferred way of dealing with international agreements over territory and boundaries. So that should be one of the goals of a settlement. Uh, so you, you want to protect the autonomy of both Ukraine and Russia. You want to calm Russia's concerns about Western uh, encroachment. And you want to strengthen international rules for resolving disagreements. Next slide. Okay, so some conclusions from Lefebvre's theory. The negotiating strategies in the West and the East are very different. In the first ethical system, you search for where you agree. Okay, what is it that we can agree upon? In the second ethical system, because you're defending your country, your value system, there is a series of ultimatums. Like, we cannot violate this uh, accord. We cannot. You cannot encroach on our territory. Okay, so, and this is what I discovered when I watched the negotiation between Lefevre and the Soviets and so forth, is that it was a series of ultimatums. You know, we'll never do this. And the other one says, we'll never do that. You know, this is, we'll never do this. And then it's, we'll never do that. And so finally, what you notice is Actually, there's something here that nobody has ruled out. And that becomes the de facto agreement. So each side can be a hero from the point of view of the second ethical system if it refuses to compromise. So both refuse to compromise. And yet, the way things are formulated, there's something that's left out and that becomes the agreement. That's not ever discussed <laughs> in my experience in the West. Okay, that's, that's a purely Soviet or second ethical system point of view. All right, next slide. Okay, so examples of that are Ukraine's destruction Complete destruction will not be permitted. Ukraine's survival and security must be preserved. Russia's security must be preserved from encouragement by NATO. And then a new border or a new regulatory institution may be needed. Like there's already talk about adjusting the border and ceding land to Russia and so forth. Next slide. Next slide. Oh. It's a contact information. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's this notion, the West always thinks you can get together and reach agreement because there is a common foundation of values, uh, peace and tranquility. The second ethical system says, no, uh, these systems are different. They're irreconcilable. And we will never compromise. We will never surrender. We will fight to the death. That's the second ethical system. Now, I would point out that both those two ethical systems are very common in the United States. And you can call them civilian ethics and military ethics, where in civilian ethics, you don't kill people. And you, you resolve your difficulties um, peacefully. But the military is there when necessary to defend your system against some transgressor. So the two ethical systems are present it's just that the West thinks of itself <laughs> as being the first ethical system. That's like those bad guys are part of the second ethical system. Sure, and not just in the military, but across the board in business and in politics and everywhere, you'll see both right. kinds. Exactly, yes. Well, can I inject something? You just expressed what, what every mass media source now is telling us. But can I express the opinion of what 
is in Putin's mind, wh why he is acting the way he is. Yeah. Well, uh, he was hoping that, uh, like I said before, that uh, his uh, speech will be translated into West, uh, into English uh, by Western media. It was not. It was completely ignored. In this speech, which is available, of course, is still uh, in Russian. I don't know if in English. But in, in, in his speech, he explained item by item why he came to conclusion that it is necessary to go to war with Ukraine. Let me tell you my own experience with Ukraine. You know, about 20 years before Ukraine became independent, 20 years when it was still a part of Soviet Union and there were no talk whatsoever about, you know, disintegration of the Soviet Union, I was over overhearing uh, talks by Ukrainian nationalists about how they will make their own currency and, and how they will become independent 20 years before that happened. Now in the year 1995, I happened to visit Kiev because I am from Kiev originally to visit and I, I, I overlooked a huge demonstration uh, of people who were carrying a coffin black, you know, in, in black. And on this coffin was a statement like, a, in this coffin, we are going to bury our friendship with Russians. And that was year 1995. Keep this in mind. So this is not a feature of suddenly from clear blue, you know, Putin decided to attack Ukraine. Absolutely no. And Ukraine was looking for each and every way to enrich itself by, for example, offering United States naval bases on the Black Sea and, and things like, I mean, many, 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 many things. Okay. And then eventually, of course, it reached the point where, where Putin defended his action by saying that on Donbass, Ukrainians always were for the past six years at least, they were, you know, constantly bombarding, shelling uh, peaceful population and uh, lots and lots of casualties and West have not, was not even aware of this. Uh, you know, they, they say, they complain that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, they try to explain this to journalists, etc., but nobody was listening to them. And so I am not... Uh, pro Putin at all, but, but I do understand why it happened. And I can, I can see it's, it's not about a fight, uh, you know, between specific peoples, it's a fight be between group in Ukraine, which decided to, to become rich by selling Ukraine to the West. That's as simple as that. And other people simply don't have any say to this in Ukraine. And Russia simply uh, is unhappy with the fact that uh, uh, it will have a neighbor which uh, will have all these NATO ba bases straight in the country, whether Ukraine is uh, a part of NATO or not. And that is why this, uh, this war started. So let's face it. We haven't heard from uh, Bill, Klaus, and uh, who else? Slava? Oh, yes, oh, you, you raised your hand. Excuse me. Excuse me, Morbid. Arkady, could you introduce yourself? Um, yeah, someone I, asked I for so your sorry. actual name. <laughs> yeah, my name is Arkady Holodenko. And we, we, in fact, I am in this uh, group, thankfully, uh, thanks to Luke Kaufman, whom I know for 20 or so years, and he knows me, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, the, the fact that I am string is exclusively because uh, the computer department of my university gave me this string. You know, I, I used to have a, a username string, so they just put it because I use a, a Zoom system from Clemson University. That's as simple as that. Thank you. Slava, you raised your hand. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I have a different uh, interpretation uh, of the scheme of uh, historical uh, cycles of uh, Russia's uh, development and its uh, current uh, state. Uh, I look at this uh, scheme uh, not from the point of view of the political regime, but uh, from the point of view of uh, modernization, uh, the type of economy and uh, public administration. And uh, this uh, can be associated with uh, two ethical systems. Uh, I agree with uh, Pavel Makienko's uh, version of uh, Byzantine uh, paternalistic thinking, uh, but now in Russia it is uh, replicated uh, differently, in my opinion. Uh, this is not uh, tyranny, but neo-patrimonialism. Uh, the Russian coat of arms is a double-headed eagle. Uh, whose heads uh, look uh, west and east. Uh, behind uh, the Russian uh, cycles, uh, there are two institutional matrices, uh, western and uh, eastern. Uh, these are not uh, geographical, but uh, cultural concepts. Uh, and uh, they just uh, correspond uh, to the uh, two ethical uh, systems of uh, Lefebvre. Institutional matrices uh, complement each other like yin and uh, yang. Uh, when uh, the Western uh, matrix dominates, uh, we have neo-patrimonialism and uh, quasi-market uh, system and economy. And uh, when the Eastern matrix uh, dominates, uh, we have a mobilization system uh, based on redistributive uh, economy. Uh, the uh, transitional stage and stages and uh, stagnation uh, are stagnation and uh, liberalization uh, between uh, neo patrimonialism and uh, mobilization uh, system. Uh, what will happen in Russia after neo neo patrimonialism? Uh, liberalization was already 20 or 30 years ago under Gorbachev, uh, Yeltsin, and at the beginning of uh, Putin's rule. Uh, therefore, most likely, if Russia remains in its current form, uh, neo-patrimonialism will be followed by an updated mobilization system. Uh, will be uh, it... Uh, uh, tyranny, uh, not necessary, uh, both in the West and in the East, hierarchical structures are gradually giving way to network uh, structures. Uh, this is happening in Russia too. Uh, therefore, most likely we will see not a collectivist uh, mobilization system like uh, the Soviet one, but a mobilization system uh, based on solidarism and uh, network uh, structures. Uh, perhaps uh, this is an unexpected uh, scenario for a Western observer, and uh, this is my answer to today's uh, blind spot uh, discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Lava, can I introduce a little bit more to what you just said? Go ahead. Uh, 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 you see, since, since a time of uh, industrialization, Stalin, you know, since time of industrialization, Russia was and still is up to this moment is a big military industrial plant. That's it. So yes, the, the yes. population is divided into two groups. One is into this military industrial complex and another which is out of it. That which is a military industrial complex are protected. Everything is fine with them as it was from the very beginning from the Stalin time. So they know how to handle this type of organization. Everything else they don't know how to handle. And so basically, even with, with disintegration of the Soviet Union, that still is a, the same, you know, military industrial complex and plant. 
and, and they don't know any other organizational system. Therefore, whatever hierarchical patterns will be there, okay, they are still subordinated to this because there is this intrinsic fear of Russia always was and still is that West is always hostile, even if it is not hostile. And yet, if you read the Russian news media, they only all what they talk is about what this or that movie star in the West, what he did and what that, you know, what all these newspapers are talking here, they, they're more obsessed with events in the West than they, with their own events in their own country. That always was the case, even under Stalin. And still, of course, now. Uh, uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, uh, in uh, Stalin times, uh, it was uh, uh, mobilization uh, system uh, of uh, Soviet uh, type, uh, which uh, based uh, on uh, hierarchy. Uh, but uh, now uh, this uh, type of uh, mobilization system is impossible. Uh, and uh, 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 we need, uh, if uh, the, uh, if uh, our hypothesis about the cycle is right, uh, we should uh, find uh, some another uh, type of uh, mobilization uh, system uh, because uh, Russia uh, is needed for uh, modernization, uh, needed uh, for uh, innovation uh, development. Klaus? I, I disagree with you, Slava. I disagree because, because of the following. The, 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 all this calculation with all this pushing of Russia was um, is based on one assumption that if you apply pressure, it's very much like a Hitler who was trying to, yeah, before he invaded Russia, uh, he had seen what had happened uh, with Finland and he decided, okay, we, uh, it is very weak door, we just push it a little bit and it will fall in the ground and Russia will be ours. Now West is doing exactly the same, which they were thinking three months will be enough we impose all these sanctions, okay, and Russia will be uh, completely collapsed. How many times we have heard now, including today's day, about how many times uh, Putin was killed? How many times we have see, heard about uh, Russia is about to, uh, you know, to make peace with Ukraine? No, Russia is not uh, uh, about to make peace. And the same with Ukraine. Why this is so? It is so because because if you let things develop, then uh, Russia can fight this war for ten years if it wants because it is like I say it's a humongous arsenal. All their all their life existence, they, they were collecting these weapons and weapons and weapons since year 1930. Okay, they have yes. plenty of them and they can fight. And therefore, West is actually going to suffer much more. And we have to look at this this way. OK, let's hear uh, from Klaus. Uh, uh, Arkady, I see and I understand you, uh, but uh, uh, there are uh, very hot uh, internal uh, discussions in Russia on this topic. Uh, I don't oh, I, know I, I fully who, aware is, of who this is right. I, 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 don't I, know. I, can, I am fully aware of this, and I can hear Russian discussions as well. OK, they, gentlemen. They uh, Klaus is is, is 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 waiting to speak. Yes, uh, Stu, can you take your your slide off? And um, I don't know how to do that. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I should do it. Okay. okay. I did